All right. Well, let's get to these WRs, these wide receivers. Again, if you're listening on the podcast, we're here with uh, Nick from FBall underscore insights on the Twitters. Great follow. Uh, go check them out. Good good blog website, fballinsights.substack.com. Uh, just a, a bunch of information uh, for your pleasure. Uh, appreciate you ha- coming on, Nick. Uh, ready to get in these wide receivers as an analytical guy. You got to love the wide receivers more than the running backs. Is that correct? Thanks for having me. Uh, enjoyed talking to you guys about the running backs. Excited to get on the pass catchers uh, for sure. But yeah, no, totally. Pass the ball, baby. Pass the ball, baby. <laughs> Got to get that wider. So, you, you know, if you're in a one QB league, you're taking you're taking the wide receiver in that first round. Um, Yeah, most likely. Better off than not. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, let's let's run through these because I, I don't think it's all that different than kind of the running backs as far as, you know, there I feel like there's a lot of discourse of who's where, and then I feel like after you get past really the, la- the, t- the top three, maybe four for some people, it really gets all over the place. Uh, so I'll be right. definitely interested to, to, to hear your insight and perspective here. It seems like you're – you were chomping at the bit to get over here. So if we could just uh, talk about the running back or the wide receivers. So I'm, I'm excited. Um, all right. So number one for me, um, I'd go JSN. I'm right there with you. Yep. And all is right. JSN in a tier by himself or is there somebody joining him? Uh, so I try not, I try to include other stuff besides the metrics when we're looking at uh, the rankings here. And when we ask those questions uh, from a production standpoint, I think he's in a tier by himself. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the stuff that I look at with the receivers, he's up there with some of the best guys from these past years. Um, from a production standpoint, uh, whether it be on value plays, whether that be getting first downs, whether that's EPA, expected points added, or just producing from the slot. Um, I think his floor is underestimated by a lot of people at the next level, just based on what today's NFL is with the passing game, and everything, um, you know, teams were questioning him being a day one pick because of him being that slot reliant guy or that 2021 year production coming from the slot right? alongside Olave and Garrett Wilson and that crazy Ohio State offense. Yeah. Um, so like that could be a reason why somebody's playing the slot because those fucking maniacs are out in the line. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like, that's the thing. It's like, hey, is he in the slot? Are those guys getting pressed? And is he? in the middle of the field, just dominating, which he did. Right. And um, I feel so like, that's like Jefferson had the same kind of snaps out wide versus maybe that was more at Addison where the, the snaps lined up more. For- yeah. So Jeff Jefferson was primarily a uh, slot guy in college and uh, I can actually. That worked out okay that. for him. Yeah, it did. Some <laughs> of the, so like seven, about 70% of uh, Jefferson's snaps on pass plays came in the slot in college. Mm-hmm. And when you look at uh, JSN, he's at 83%. Yeah. So JSN was a little bit more slot dependent, and Justin Jefferson had a little bit more production outside of like that one. But there's also year. there was also just Chase and the other guys being, you know, there's also yeah. Olave and Garrett Wilson on the outsides right. with, with and, him. So you kind of have to put that in there. And if you're going to tell me that JSN a guy... JSN was playing out wide in the bowl game. Right. Well, if you're going to tell me a guy like JSN who can be so productive from the slot, which you should use him in the slot because... That's where he can be productive. But like if you're going to tell me at the next level, when they go to two wide receivers, you can't throw him outside so he doesn't come off the field. Like, I think that's ridiculous. Right. Totally. And I think like that's where you start to question is he in a tier by himself? Because like when you think of slot guys in this draft, you should be thinking of like a Josh Downs. Right. Like right, right, Elijah right. Moore from la- or a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Right. JSN's like totally there. The thing with Justin Jefferson, too, is the questions of man coverage. And like he just didn't really get the experience or opportunities to go up against it being in the slot at LSU. Yeah. And and I think that goes back to some of the uh premises we were talking about with the running backs, which was hey, just because they didn't get the opportunities to show in college doesn't mean they can't do it. Yeah. So I think with JSN, like you were saying on the outside, like just because he was a slot guy in college isn't going to prevent you from putting him out there, especially if you're in 12 personnel sure. and you got two wide receivers on the field. Totally. I'm right there with you. And I think uh, from a production standpoint, um, he pops off the charts compared to everyone else, uh, especially when you look at like, yards per route run against man and zone coverage. Um, there's guys that have their strengths. Uh, we'll get to one of my favorite wide receivers in this draft soon uh, who's pretty predominant on one of those man and zone coverage, but Jackson Smith and Jigba is great at both. I mean, he's got great production against man and zone and pretty much everything that we look at. So from a production standpoint, he's my clear wide receiver one in the class. I think from a general perspective, if you were to, I don't know, 
pick between him, Quentin Johnston, and Jordan Addison. Uh, you can make arguments for all three of those guys number going number one, but for yeah. me, I'm with JSN. Okay, so I would probably I'm sticking with Addison as number two for me. Okay, um, what are your what are your thoughts on the next two to three guys? Did Addison's combine affect how you feel about him? That's what I really want to know from an analytical standpoint. Um, a little bit. Um, I think he weighed in pretty light. Oh yeah, sure. And I think uh, you see some of the metrics and some of the things that jump out on you and especially his last year at USC were some of the numbers against man coverage. Um, but you try to break that down and that's something from analytics. You can look at just the sheer numbers, but then you want to look at um, some of the context that goes into it. I know you guys are film guys. You guys want to break down the all 22. Um, you know, LaVisca Chenault was a man coverage guy, but when you're running a lot of screens and you're a big yak, you know, yeah. it can, you can really scheme up some of those plays and those catches. So like, there's a lot of context that goes into it that you only get from watching and you right. get from charting the data. Right. So I think that's where the numbers and watching kind of blend in and combine together. And with uh, Jordan Addison, you know, guys played on his college quarterbacks have been Kenny Pickett and Caleb Williams. Not too bad. Right. Um, but he's another guy that I think that you could pick with Quentin Johnson, JSN. If you were to tell me here, he, even if he was, you know, wide receiver one, you know, I'm not going to necessarily disagree with you. The guy's body of work is impressive. Um, I think he can run a full route tree right away when right. he hits the league. Right. Um, of course, he's got those press coverage concerns with the weight. That's only going to that. See that? It. That's like I don't have a concern at all because if you watch the film, good luck getting your fucking hands on that guy. Right. Like, right. He's so quick with his footwork off the line, and like his hand work isn't decent. Now I'm sure there's guys at the NFL that can give him problems. Um, there were some instances but, where he was getting a little bullied, but then there were so many instances where they were trying to get on him and they just couldn't. Uh, as far as like you were saying, we had some man coverage. I'd be at, at USC. Like how much of that man coverage was maybe when he was dealing with an ankle or something like that, where maybe he wasn't at a hunt. Now I know you're gonna have to deal with those things at the next level too. But Man, how, that was a how gross of, looking roll up that he had put on him. Like, how much of that is weighted into him maybe playing not at full strength? I guess was my question there, which is an impossible uh, answer maybe, but yeah, that, that definitely comes into consideration. Um, I think you try to isolate some of those things too, where like he's going from Pittsburgh to USC and he's going under Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams. Like mm -hmm. he was their guy there and they definitely schemed up a lot of passes to him. Right. Um, quite a lot of yak and stuff coming from screens. And yeah. so like you try to take that into consideration, but like, like you said, you know, running the full route tree right away when you get there and trying to, you know, keep that guy contained on the line of scrimmage. Good luck. Yeah. You know, he's able, again, one of those things where like he can do other things and make up for it. And like the speed and some of the concerns from the combine aren't as damning uh, to me for him as some other guys in the class. I agree. Cause you see, you see the, I, you just see the tactician and the separation on the field when you watch him play. Um, right. So it doesn't concern me all that much. The being a little lighter, isn't the best thing ever, but he doesn't, he doesn't look, from going from expecting maybe 180 to 173 for him doesn't doesn't do what it did for Evans from going from 215 to 202 for me. Yeah, um, right. So why isn't why isn't Quentin Jefferson dominating Johnson. Quentin Johnston dominating the top rankings here? Being I don't know he wasn't six four he came in at six two but just being this freak uh, player here why why isn't he just solely just number one right now? I think I think it's some of those intrinsic values at at a receiver position. Mm -hmm. I think it's the uh, opposite of a Jackson Smith and Jigbo, where you know you question Quentin Johnson like catching with. Perfect, there's people, yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you you catch you know, hey, why doesn't he catch with his hands? Like some of that stuff. It's like, all right, come on now. Like, did you watch him at the combine? Like there was that play where he had a crazy vertical on one of those passes yeah. uh, from the quarterbacks. I mean, like the guy's a freak athlete. Uh, lined up vast majority of his uh, snaps out wide. But at his size and um, his athleticism, you know, being out wide, but also having that yak ability is a rare athlete. Yeah. You know, when you look at, at guys, I mean, the first thing it reminds me of when you just look at discourse or think about that is like DK Metcalf sure. or AJ Brown or Debo Samuel, where you're like, hey, look at this guy's size and weight. You know, we can try and ticky tack some of the college production there. Right. But, you know, depending where he lands, like that's a guy that the right NFL Coach. team or offense wants to work with yeah. like you're going to scheme it up like yeah. when he was in the slot at tcu which wasn't too much like the guy was insane right. so like that's something that's only going to increase the nfl with a little bit more creative play callers like in the national championship game you know he was their guy for tcu 
like, you know, good luck, Doug, and try and throw to someone else. Yeah. So, like, there was some criticism with that game, but, like, he popped off in the game Ugh, before that. People yeah. want to so just like, bury him crush, because he got Michigan, right. but because right. he, the Georgia shut him down. It's like, who didn't yeah. they shut down? Although, I guess Ohio State played, played him pretty damn good. But uh, <laughs> Great game, yeah. You said 6-2. I was for sure thinking 6-2, but I'm looking at both the RAS score and – NFL.com combine results, and this says straight 6-3. I thought it was 6-2. So, 6-3. That, that means he's good. Semantics. Yeah. Only 208. We thought he might be 215, but. Right. So, but Quentin Johnston seems, is he, he's not necessarily three for you. He's is he kind of just one and a half. Um, I got, right. so I've got, I got Quentin Johnston as uh number two, two and three, like interchangeable okay. with Jordan yeah. Addison. That JSN's one for me. And if you were to Jordan Addison, Quentin Johnson are two and three. So that'd be a different tier. You'd have Jason in tier one and then Addison and Johnston in tier two. That'd be correct. Yeah. I could kind of keep them all in one, but I could throw Jason. I could, I could be, I basically feel the same way you do. Um, yeah. So let's keep it. JSN moving. feels the safest. For sure. Um, he is. And I, I, if there's a, I can kind of throw a stat in here too. Um, one thing I like to look at, with some of these college receivers is not necessarily just sheer metrics, whether that be yards after the catch, right? Like um, man coverage, zone coverage, but just pure impact and value receiving, right? Like what are guys doing when the defense knows you're going to pass the ball, right? Like, can you beat that defense, beat that coverage when that happens? And so I found that a lot of receivers who are just accumulating first downs, you know, really translates to the NFL. And so, like, I was looking at wide receivers from 2017 to this past year um, and just looking at their first down per targets, right? So, like, that ratio. JSN's got to be – and Addison's got to be ridiculous. Right. So, if based on the threshold, which you can find on Twitter here too, wide receivers from 2017 and 2022, um, first down per target leader, Jalen Waddell. Number two is JSN. Number three is Jamar Chase. Four, C.D. Lamb. Five, Devontae Smith. Six, uh, Hollywood Brown. Seven, Chris Olave. Eight, Marvin has, Marvin Harrison Jr. If you want to uh, sure. Go add Debbie. that threshold in there, you yeah. got to throw him in there. He's got enough games, right? And then sure. uh, after that, barely uh, behind Marvin is Justin Jefferson. So, I mean, like you look at some of that value, whether that be EPA. Um, Those are stats for college? Down. Yep. Yeah, first down per target. I love it. That's That's a good... A good seems like moving the chains matters, you know. Yeah, totally. Like who, you know, when the defense knows you're going to pass the ball, like right. you're going to throw it to your best guy. And so, like when you look at a guy who may not be up there in first downs per target, like I'm looking here, and the name that drop or pops off at the bottom of the chart is Jalen Rager. Like, mm-hmm. why is he not getting first downs at TCU? Like we right. see him for with targets there. And so it's obviously a little bit of Monday morning quarterbacking. Sure. But like you think about that stuff, and it's like, hey, like where's you know, this guy's. Quentin Johnston, he yeah. So the thing with Johnston is he's kind of like right in the middle in this All chart. Right. I'm looking at where it's yards per route run, first down per target, production impact. You know, how can we outlay that? You know, a guy who's got a lot of yards per route run, but not a lot of first down per target. Jalen Rager, Leviska Chenault, Paris Campbell are some of the names that pop off here. So Ooh, they might be getting a lot of yards. Yeah, and then the other way around, where you look at the guys who got a ton of first downs but really didn't put up too much sheer volume in college, a guy like Terry McLaurin. You know, the guy was popping off in the uh, value plays, whether that be EPA or first downs. We didn't really put up a huge yards per hour on at Ohio State. And so that's what made him drop. But, you know, in hindsight, you look back on it, it's like, hey, should you miss that one? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So like that's kind of I think you learn a lot year by year with some of these receivers and pass catchers. And uh, that's the stuff I've been looking at, stuff I've been interested in this offseason is are some of those value metrics and what they're adding to their teams. All are outside of the individual production. So yeah, I think that's um, great. Didn't mean to go on a tangent there. Oh no, that was perfect. That's uh, yeah. That's why we brought very, you in. Very much enjoyed that. Uh, so what yeah. would be uh, Zay Flowers would be four for me. Uh, okay. And who? So you know, if you have a group of guys next, or if you have an individual guy next, or yeah. So you know, what so do you, think? you were you were saying that uh, QJ Jordan Addison Jackson Smith and Jigba were in that tier of their own. Then there's probably a drop off. I'm for the most part with you there because you could convince me that JSN's in those tier of guys. Mm. There's a drop off. I'm with you there. And like, that's where this class is kind of reminiscent of 2016 where like, you know, you don't have like that crazy guy or, you know, these right. home run prospects, but you get into a crop of guys that have their strengths and have their known weaknesses and landing spots going to matter. 
but the, the thought process behind it matters too. And so like my number four is Marvin Mims. All right. And he's a guy that even before the combine, uh, the numbers are really loving out of Oklahoma. Uh, the thing with him is obviously, you know, you watch the tape, a lot of busted coverage mm-hmm. um, and pretty big zone guy. But when you look at some of the value metrics, um, the guy is just, he's been very incredible. I mean, I tweeted out something yesterday and it was EPA per play from college receivers um, in their career since 2013 in the power five, you know, minimum 150 play threshold, right? I looked at wide receivers that averaged at least 1.0 career EPA per play or greater in that time frame. So a lot of criteria going into it. And it was try to get a lot of years in there. And there were four wide receivers that made it. Um, C. Lamb, Devontae Smith, Jamar Chase, Marvin Mims. That's Marvin a, Mims is, yeah. That's a great Marvin, gr- group. Yeah, Marvin Mims has been incredibly valuable, especially against zone coverage. Um, I think that in today's NFL, like, you got to be able to beat zone. I think that man really tells you or can give you some context and how you can do one-on-one against guys. Mm -hmm. But um, when you overlay zone and man performance, if you're really good at man, but you know, aren't really impressive on zone, your floor becomes into high question. And so some of those guys are like LaVisca Chanel, or you look at uh, Juwan Jennings, Uh, you know, those guys can beat man, but how much of that is schemed up and how much of that is low a dot um, and relying on athleticism with zone you know, if you can beat zone, like that's most of the snaps or most of the routes you're going to run in the NFL. So like you see that and you see what he can do. Marvin Mims has popped off to me. And I think, uh, you know, the numbers don't lie when you look at some of these value plays and you go back to 2013, like I was looking at with EPA and uh, Marvin Mims is, is my four, you know, wide receiver class where you're kind of looking for that, that extra thing to push you over the edge after those top three guys, um, the uh, value production out of Marvin Mims puts him at four for me well okay so obviously you know Mims just came in and crushed the combine so I feel like he's trending up um because that's just kind of how the way things work we, we talk a lot about public perception weighing into so much of how we're you know basically trying to figure out your values and then maximizing and capitalizing on the public's opinion of things I think that's just kind of how fantasy works um, right in my opinion um and I think, uh, I think like too, you think about it for fantasy and Zay Flowers, you said was your four. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, he's a guy that's, I think a lot of film guys are really into, um, you know, four year dude out of Boston college, uh, couldn't touch him in a telephone booth type of, uh, mm-hmm. type of jitters. And, um, you know, he's a guy that's explosive, you know, he's a guy that's got that it factor that you want. Right. Um, has the potential to really be someone besides a role guy in the NFL, right? Not someone who's just held down or bogged down to the slot or on certain downs. Like I, that's what I see with Zay Flowers. Um, the thought process with a guy like Marvin Mims with Zay Flowers or you know Jalen Hyatt is if you're in a, you know ten leagues and originally you were going Zay Flowers at eight out of ten of those in the mid rounds, mm-hmm. you know diversify it up, right? Like right. from eight to six, and then you add Marvin Mims there for a few of those extra uh, teams. Like that's, that's my thought process on it. On the volume perspective, you know, change it up, right? Like Agreed. use the likelihoods, probabilities. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So if, if Mims, how many times out of 10 are you taking Mims? <laughs> for me? Oh man. 10. Yeah. So he's least. in a tier of his own right here for you. Uh, I'd say he starts off that next tier after the top three guys you we were talking about. Would the um, would the draft change your opinion on Mims, or is it just a, just doesn't matter? You're sticking with the the um, I forget what the phrasing you're using for the um, metric that you're kind of uh, EPA value, per play? yeah e- EPA no yeah. Val- value like, yeah production, value like metrics production. or whatever where you you got a couple right. different ones that are and when you say that that's EPA yeah expected points added so like basically with expected points is like not all yards in football are like created equal sure so like a five yard gain on like third and three can increase your team's chances of scoring like much more than like being on your own 10 yard line and converting that is pff giving that stat out no so like you can find that um with some of the data like nfl fast r um you can find that on rbsdm.com slash stats or whether you go to like the 33rd team and sports info solutions and that data 
you can kind of um, crunch up the numbers yourself or, or kind of uh, just look at what they do by season. Um, I gather their data by season. And I've compiled all this throughout their whole college careers. And so um, EPA is typically used, I guess, when you look at analytical people with, um, with like quarterbacks, team offense and like team performance. So you're measuring on like a per play basis, like the expected points added per play, which obviously you're not scoring an actual touchdown or kicking sure. a field goal every play, but you're trying to quantify it as much as possible. That's why it's a little bit more team level. But, you know, in the NFL, quarterback is like the position that touches the ball every play, right? Like they are a lot more valuable than almost every other position on the field, right? So like it's pretty substantial in the NFL. The reason I like EPA in college and when you think about it intuitively is like, you know, guys who are skilled players have a drastic impact on a game, at least right on a heavier basis, you know, more than the NFL level. So like you have to account for that, um, you know, there's no hiding that at the college level. So that's why EPA with the skill players is interesting to me. And sure. uh, that's why I use that. So makes sense. Um, would, would there be a, if Mims is a fourth round player and Zay flowers is a first round player, does that. Yeah. Like that's something where, uh, you know, if Zay flowers going, that's where you start to think, Hey, Zay flowers going in the first round of the NFL draft, you know, he's probably going to go to a decent situation. He's not going to go top 10, right? Like he's mm. going to go in the mid to late first. Right. Right. Versus Marvin Mims goes in, on day two, like at the worst case, like, you know, you're projecting all this out and you're not projecting Marvin Mims to be a first round pick, mm -hmm. right? Like he's going to go day two. The expectations aren't there as like a JSM. To answer your question, I would like a Marvin Mims day two pick over like a Zay Flowers um, first round pick. Mm -hmm. But like from a, from isolating their individual performance a little bit better, um, I'm a little bit indifferent on those two. Zay Flowers comes in after me at number five in my wide receiver rankings for this right. class behind Marvin Mims. Uh -huh. So like, I think those are interchangeable. Like you could have Zay Flowers at four, just based off of like what he can do with the ball in his hands. Sure. And like, that'll convince me that he's the wide receiver four. the Marvin Mims stuff just pops out to me from value production. Um, just trying to stay principal with the stuff that I'm finding. And like Marvin Mims and JSN are definitely my guys in this draft class. You, you mentioned Hyatt a minute ago. How, how different is Mims than Hyatt? Um, I like Mims quite a bit more than Hyatt. Uh -huh. do, they, um, do they do similar things? Yeah. So Mims is primarily a uh, zone coverage guy. Mm -hmm. So like in college, Marvin Mims was, uh, you know, 54% of his stuff was out wide. Jalen Hyatt actually saw the vast majority of his work in the slot and against man coverage. And you think about that Tennessee offense last year with Jalen Hyatt and like he had a lot of opportunities to really uh, right. exude his strengths. So like one interesting stat that I found and so I don't mean to interrupt you guys no. on a tangent here, but uh, like with, you know, we want to blend in stats, but we want to look at like charted data. And I think that gives you good context on things. And so like things like contested targets and contested catches are something that I like to look at. I think it gives you a little bit of insight, right? You can't like have too guy, many of those. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So, like, contested catches is something that, you know, a lot of people like to look at. Can a guy win jump balls one-on-one? -on -one? But contested targets, you know, if you don't have tracking data on a guy specifically, if a guy's got a ton of contested targets, he's probably not getting open too much, right? So, like, with Jalen Hyatt, if you look at data from PFF, he led the SEC in contested targets against man coverage last year. The whole, the whole conference, right? Uh-huh. Excuse me, just regular targets against man coverage. So saw a lot of man coverage targets in general. None of them were contested. So he led the conference of man coverage targets. None of them were contested. That's, that's like good. That's like that is separating. That's like unprecedented. Like you with man coverage, you unprecedented. Yes. Oh, you saw that Bill Burr skit where he said unprecedented. <laughs> yeah, like it started like, an you know, argument. You know, you think about this and hey, man, coverage, like you're you're probably going to grab a little bit more contact from defenders. You know, you're going to be with a guy for a whole play or when you get targeted. So like naturally contested targets are going to come with man, at least again, you know, that versus zone right. to have none to have none is like, you know, does he really get open that much better than every receiver ever in college football? Yeah. And so it's like you look at that and then you think of Tennessee's offense and think of the scheme you know, and how the, what right. They're 
Exactly. So, I mean, like he's busting through the tops of defenses. Don't get me wrong. And that straight line speed is what is mocking him potentially, you know, as day one guy, although that's, you know, that's shifting over to day two and on for him right now. But, yeah. you know, that's that's his bread and butter. And so, like, you think about that, it's like, hey, he's got one really big year of production. Is it a coincidence that all this came in the scheme, you know, knowing his right. straight line speed and his strength? Like, you know, is that – can you catch lightning in a bottle with high in college? And can he repeat that in the NFL? Cause like you think about what he can do down the field. If Tyree kill was able to beat the tops off of defenses and defenses weren't adjusting to him doing that, he might still be a Kansas city chief. <laughs> sure. Because like, because of, you know, because the defenses weren't allowed to do it, you know, Mahomes has been throwing it short or relying on yards after the catch in recent years. And so like the chiefs are like, Hey, you know, doesn't it kind of defeats the purpose a little bit of Tyree Kill when we have one of the best quarterbacks, if not the best quarterback ever, right? In Mahomes on our team, like we can make do. So it's like you think of Hyatt, and it's like, all right, if that's his strength, like, yeah, there's a ton of value with that in the league. You know, when you have your portfolio wide receivers, you would love a guy who can beat the tops off. But For is sure. that a guy you want to spend a is that right. one and right. you want to get a first round pick on in fantasy? Can you rely on that on weekly production? Like that's what I think. When it comes to Jalen, I, I think that was a, a nice summation at the end there. Kind of yeah. how I feel. I feel similarly. And just right. to be snarky, you can't have too many contested targets, but you can't have zero either. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're right. Yes, exactly. something's up. We need a okay amount of we need contested to, targets. We need to contextualize this, figure it yeah. out. Right, and then versus like you know, if you look at the other end of the spectrum, like Nikhil Harry put up some nice numbers oh. in college and, and yards after the catch, but I mean, like that dude was in the slot because he couldn't get open. Right, yeah. like everything was contested. Well, that's, contested. I feel like that's when the contested that's where, catch that target is the, uh, threshold really came into play when everybody yeah, was on. Exactly. They were like, "Hey, we exactly. got to figure out Harry's something stat. that uh, <laughs> could solve this," because he was everyone's metric darling. Like they were like, oh, "You yeah. can't miss with Nikhil Harry. He needs to be the one one uh -huh. in in non superflex drafts." And yeah. uh, they had to figure out something to make him a tight end. Out why that didn't work. Right. And he's a great uh, he's a great learning example, or at least you look at what he could do, which is the yards after the catch. And, and, and you remember some of those takes and then you look at some of the other stuff like, hey, like he was in the slot, you know, a lot of contested targets. Like, And our argument in the for him was that he wasn't separating, but that that yields to a high contested target as well. So that's a it's a good stat to kind of match up with what you might see on film. Right. All right, exactly. so hit me with uh, a couple other guys that you would rank out here in your top, you know, eight, ten, ten guys here. Because I don't, I feel similarly like I do to the running backs. Like it's kind of a log jam here. Is Downs in the next? Is Rishi Rice in the next? Is Tillman in the next? I know you like Mims. You brought him up. Boutte is he? You know who's who's rating for you? Yeah. So after after Marvin Mims and Zay Flowers, you know those guys round out the top five for me. Mm -hmm. And then you get to six. I got Tank Dell. Tank um, Dell. Oh, interessante. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I really liked his numbers. Um, I Weight used 105. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. In your bra. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's definitely something you take into consideration. He's another guy that just was really valuable in college. A uh, ton of EPA, um, could beat man coverage. And, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a class with size that's lacking in general, mm -hmm. um, you can look at some of the other stuff, right? Like it's not like you get a bunch of Quentin Johnsons in here and right. Tank Dell is like, oh man, like well, the, the other opposite look. of the extreme. A bit. Right. Yeah. So like I look at that, I see his numbers against man coverage. Um, you know, I think that that guy for his size is kind of a dog. Um, so I like that there. Uh, you, Tank you, you've been, you've been uh, you, you kind of noted some of those uh, like all time receiver stats for, first downs uh, per target or whatever. And there was a couple of uh, light, you know, Devonta Smith was in there. Hollywood Brown was in there. There's some mm. lighter guys. I don't know how much it, it matters. I don't think it matters as much. Obviously you want that prototypical, you know, size speed freak DK Metcalf, but like, you know, Devonta Smith doesn't seem bothered by anything going on in the NFL, Hollywood no. Brown either, you know, so, you know, I don't think it's, you know, you're interesting because a lot of other guys on some of these a lot some of these guys that you're pulling up at the top would be just so out because of some, you know, silly size threshold, threshold of size or weight or whatever, but you're you're looking at it through a different lens of uh, you know, 
productive metrics that say, hey, the, these things stand out to make you seemingly be in the in the effective category. Exactly. And in a class where there's like, you know, not much to differentiate outside that top three, like you got to look at that stuff. And it's really interesting when you when you lay it all out there and what's going to happen with them, just because like you're looking for something to give someone an edge over another guy Yeah, where, you know, they're interchangeable at six and seven and seven and eight and so on. So like you look at that, you know, put up a ton of production there at Houston and, uh, you know, that and some of the clips from the senior bowl were, um, we're pretty nasty yeah. in a good way. Yeah, so for sure. After that, tanked out six. I uh, got Jalen Hyde at, at seven. Uh, you know, as much as I may have been knocking on the guy there for <laughs> <laughs> a little tangent, um, the guys, the guys are burnt. Like, yeah. If you depending on where you grab them, like totally worth it. Totally worth the flyer. Um, so Did I got you say him. His on field speed is faster than the four two, four four, four flat that he ran. <sighs> yeah, that's the thing. Is it's like hey. Because I've never so seen fast. anyone get knocked for running a four four. You know, it was he was so fast. He had zero contested targets against me. <laughs> right. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, oh man, this guy's like, uh, this guy's Usain Bolt out here. But, yeah. You know, <laughs> so so high and then no no um, Boutte love no Downs no Rice I, Tillman yeah so Mingo. I got well who's next I got I got Downs at eight. Okay. Um, Xavier Hutchinson, nine. Nice. I like Xavier Hutchinson. And then I got Cedric Tillman at 10. I like Tillman too. And so, yeah. So Tillman, like we were talking, uh, you know, we are talking on Twitter uh, back and forth and we were just kind of going over stuff post combine. And I decided to look at some of the uh, RS relative athletic scores, some of these guys. And, you know, with Tillman, it's interesting, right? Because like he's been at Tennessee for a little while and he's got a little bit more stable production mm-hmm. than Jalen Hyatt. But he's a different receiver. And in a class with, you know, that's thin at size, Bingo. like he stands out. Yeah. So, like, you look at that, I'm looking at some of the RAS and, like, took a few screenshots here, like 9.57. And I got Terry McLaurin, 9.56. You know, right. like uh, 9.57, you know, just for shits and gigs, DK Metcalf, 9.66. So you're looking at some of these outside nice. guys. You look at these outside guys and you're like, hey, you know, how does he compare? Obviously, he's not DK Metcalf athlete. No. But, you know, he's like, it's, he's it's an ass. good. Yeah. He almost right. called him he's, DK Metcalf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe oh, he is. Man. He does come out with some wild ass hair sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that, like, yeah. baby pacifier. But, but no, I like the idea of Tillman being a, the bigger bodied kind of Hutchinson as well. Mingo yeah. seems like he he's got a good RAS score and seems like he's got a bit bigger of a body. Yeah, I mean, like that's the thing with this class is like you can really divvy them up and like we right. were just going through the middle of that class. We went what Marvin Mims, Zay Flowers, Tank Dell, Josh Downs. It's like holy right. cow! Like where and then is, he threw some bigger bodies back in? Yeah. Right. Yeah, you get Cedric Tillman. You get uh, you know Rasheed Rice. Like you think yeah. it's you know, relatively some of the bigger guys. Like it's, it's really all over the place. So it's like pick your pick your strengths, pick what you like. I think if you have the right process going into the evaluations, whether that be just off of the numbers and then going into the combine, I think you can make the right pick, no matter what your opinion on a guy is, right? Like 40 yard dash is going to matter a lot more for a guy like Jalen Hyatt than it is for a guy like Jackson Smith and Jigbo. That's why JSN didn't run it. But like in the other drills at the combine, his his agility showed Mm. and he tested really well. And the explosion, yeah. right, Right, the three cone, the short shuttle, like, you know, he, he was impressive there. And as a slot guy, like, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. And it checks those boxes or confirms priors. Um, the things you're priors. Looking, yeah, exactly. All the lingo. So, like, you're uh, you're just kind of, you know, if you go into it with that and you're like, hey, like, this stuff matters for him. There's a reason he's not running it. There's guys, you know, on, it's Good a for him. Conversation. Good for yeah. him. Don't yeah. run that so, shit. Yeah. So, like, you know, as long as you go into it, that thought process with this class, there's a lot of interchangeable guys, depending on where they land. And if you take them in the mid rounds, like you can find reasons and to grab them or reasons to avoid. So, yeah. How uh, come you're not higher on Rasheed Rice? What's what's uh, what's up with Rasheed? Um, I actually I like him um, a little bit after the combine. Uh, there were some questions against press coverage for him. But, uh, you know, with Rasheed Rice, like I forgot what his 10 uh, yard split was, but I think it was pretty good. It was, yeah, it was, well, he's pretty. He's very explosive for his size. Four nine. Is that? 
maybe one five yeah one. yeah something like that yeah for sure and like so like He's that's top five rad score of this class for sure yeah uh, and so like that's a guy hey, split and, was one four nine right yeah, so middle rounds, that guy, he's more of a project than some of these other dudes that will come in right away. Like Josh Downs, you know, in the slot, depending on where he goes. Um, you know, a lot of the numbers for Josh Downs, uh, by the way, like pretty similar to Elijah Moore out of school. Whether that be size right. yeah, and production out of the slot, like that's a guy that, um, you know, you're, you're measuring or you're evaluating floors and knowing what guys are going to do at the next level. Like you didn't know Justin Jefferson was going to become – wide receiver one in the NFL and be mm-hmm. this absolute beast against man coverage. Like if you, if you said that was going to happen, like props to you, but like, I think you're exaggerating it a little bit, <laughs> but on the, on the other hand, like a guy like Josh Downs, you, you know, he's not going to be a wide receiver one X and that's okay. Like right. he could be, he could be a good slot receiver, but like you have guys like Downs where you know what he's going to do at the next level. It's up, you know, it, you're just questioning like how good or how great can he be at it? And mm-hmm. there's other guys that could really be all over, you know, Quentin Johnston, like, you know, what's going to happen there? Jordan Asset, what's going to happen there? Zay right. Flowers, you know, what's going to happen? So, like, you measure all that stuff, um, and I think it's interchangeable, right? Like, and, and so uh, that's that's the benefit, if there is, to having the um, little undiversified class is that, like, you know, you can look at them, some of that stuff, depending on where they land or depending what you're looking towards. If you need some guys who are, are burners or you need guys who are X's, right? Like you're going to be able to find your X receiver, or your bigger dudes later on. Yeah. Whether that be Cedric Tillman, Rasheed Rice. So if you're in need of that, hey, you might lock out there because like the smaller guys are going to be going a little bit earlier. Yeah. So like if you're in that situation or that predicament, nice, good for you. So yeah. it's like you just kind of think of it from all angles there. And uh, yeah. So no, no bootay for you? Yeah, so Boutte is just, you know. I'm not messing with him, but. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not too high on Boutte. Um, looking at some of the guys down here towards the bottom. Yeah, here. Like, give, give us give us some give us some sleepers for the uh, for the wide receivers. Um, yeah, so when you look at some of like the production metrics, uh, Cedric Tillman's a guy like when, you know, 0.87 EPA per play. Um one of the highest in the class throughout college. Marvin Mims is at one EPA per play. Jackson Smith is at one EPA per play. Those are the top two in EPA out of guys in this class. But mm-hmm. then, you know, you look at some of the guys that are also up there. Um, Cedric Tillman. Um, Rakeem Jarrett's not too bad in EPA. Tyler Scott has a good EPA who's – I've seen some mixed reviews on on Twitter and everything. Uh, haven't gotten too much into the smaller school guys besides – Nate Dell and uh, Rasheed Rice, but mm-hmm. you know, um, Max receivers are naturally going to have more EPA. Like those are the guys that are getting targeted downfield, and so like those are going to be bigger plays, more yards, which is you know conducive to expected points added. But like guys like Cedric Tillman, um, you know, Rasheed Rice, like those are the guys. Like I was saying, like those you're going to be able to get them a little bit later on. And they also have the upside, which is what you're drafting them for in the first place, to like hit. So like it's kind of like a, a whammy there, two and one. Um, mm-hmm. So I mean, like, yeah, I think I have those guys. Kishan Booty, uh, you know, staying away from him. Uh, Any thoughts you know, on At Perry? Uh, yeah, so he's another guy where it's like some pretty severe splits. In some of his metrics, right? Like Wake Forest's um, downfield guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he's another guy you're able to grab in the middle rounds. And, um, yeah, I, I, the testing was pretty good for him, and I like what I saw on film. I don't. He's he's kind of floating in in space right now for me. I'm not sure what to do with him. A guy speaking of the combine, uh, Bryce Ford Wheaton with yeah, I think, I'm really impressive. In- what do you yeah. what do you think about I know nothing about him. Yeah, so like he's another guy that's like you know, his his uh yards per route run against man and zone coverage throughout his college are both under 2, which is a little bit iffy out of West Virginia. Um but you know, tested well athletically at the combine. Um for a guy like that, like that's another upside play that you draft later on. Like I think there's a lot of those guys in this class. Would it be that or Jalen Moreno proper? Right. Like you got guys that are just out there and um, Bobo, 
mm-hmm. uh, out of uh, UCLA, Mingo. Like, I think those are like the third tier guys in this class where like you're going to be able to get some of them later on. One of them might hit, one of them yes. might have one of those strengths, like really get exacerbated in the NFL and they can, you know, catch lightning in a bottle there. And uh, that's what you're kind of aiming for when you're, when you're looking at fantasy too, is if you're in a lot of leagues, right? Like you're, you're, you're segmenting these guys out and, you know, if you're, you could be high in Zay Flowers versus, you know, Marvin Mims, but if you're in a lot of leagues, you know, diversify it up a little bit. Sure. It's basically like what, what you're going after. So. Sure. All right, man. Well, we'll wrap this up and we, we very much appreciate it. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, thank you for breaking down a bunch of different insights. Tell us, uh, where we can find your, your stuff again in the Twitter handle. Totally. Yep. So on Twitter, you can follow me at, at football insights. So F B A L L underscore insights. And then, uh, either on Twitter or just through here, I have a sub stack where just kind of give my thoughts on some of the data visuals and, and uh, opinions I have on some of the metrics with this draft class. Um, you can find that on sub stack. So, football insights no um underscore there so football insights dot substack dot com uh either one of those you can find stuff for free um find opinions some valuable um some data that's a little bit easier to process through the eyes so yeah what do you get with the subscription over there subscription if you uh if you were to pay for it you get private stuff uh private articles that are just to people who pay for it um, haven't divvied too much into it yet, but there is uh, some demand coming in over the recent months and just kind of getting a little bit more popular. We with get the spreadsheets, dog. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just. He's more of a chart guy. Like, He's... Yeah. <laughs> when we get the charts, dog. Yeah. <laughs> totally. But uh, yeah, so you can follow me there on Twitter. Um, and, you know, always DMs are open, whether you have requests or questions. Slide in. Um, Right, totally, totally open to answering them, and I'm an open book. I uh, I personally come from a baseball background, so I was you know I was talking to you guys a little bit earlier about that, but off air, uh, yeah, exactly. So like you know my my stuff is a little bit less football oriented, at least like from my history of baseball. You can isolate variables, pitcher, batter, sure. football. You have a lot of moving parts, a lot of and so like yeah, exactly. It's constantly changing. That's what makes it really interesting. But with some of the skill position guys, I think you got to, you know, you can look at all the numbers you want. You got to be able to uh, get some context in there and you can mm. find that through through charted metrics like contested targets, right? Like passes from on screens through the slot, yeah. man in zone coverage, first like downs. trying to ice for first downs. Yep. EPA, like you try to isolate it as much as possible and, and really try and uh, get a nice portfolio of guys you have to work with come draft season. So, you know, that's my viewpoints on it. I'm, you know, having that baseball background, I consider myself uh, pretty much an open book and open to new things and looking at new numbers or new ideas. And yeah. so I've taken requests or, you know, gotten some really great questions in the DMs on Twitter just from some of the stuff I've thrown out there. And it's been thought provoking. So if you're interested, you know, you can find me at those handles and uh, I'd be glad to uh, look into any questions. Yeah. Please make sure you reach out to him because he's been great and answered everything that we've thrown his way so really appreciate you be sure you like subscribe comment below all that jazz on our youtube channel um and and through the podcast and uh always me that five star review always know that you can the best way to gather context is to watch football <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but there's no. no statistical context stats casey yeah he, he, i felt like he was throwing a jab without knowing he's like well you know you can get context through charts <laughs> <laughs> yeah we didn't uh we didn't get to battle as much as i was hoping to well um, i don't this, know this uh, guy very well yet yeah. but <laughs> he, I, like but he nice also guy. i what, love the nice analytical guys very few and far between what was nice <laughs> was that there wasn't it wasn't so it wasn't staunch it well, wasn't so staunch it wasn't and it also wasn't the same like everyone you you know you had like i said before like you had a nice way of kind of going about it where you didn't get caught up in some some of the things that we kind of think are silly like obviously i want to know i think you only said a dot like one time i want to know some of those <laughs> historical thresholds but I like i just don't think some of them matter as much as sometimes people wait certain ones Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, like to, to go off of that point too, if you look at some of the work, even just from Twitter and like, I like to compile like guys' career numbers mm-hmm. because that makes you and forces you to look into their season splits. 
and see like, hey, when these guys got older, did they you know, get more out wide? Did they get more opportunities here or, or, or whatnot? So, you know, football has a little bit less data than other sports, at least baseball where I come from. Mm -hmm. So if you get career numbers, you have more data to work with, but it forces you to look at some of the context you only get from watching the game, mm -hmm. but also from that like contextual like right. data or charting. So like, that's what, that's what I like to do with that. And like, you know, that, that's what matters. I think it's balancing that and, uh, and yeah. Yeah, that was some of the best descripting of kind of how to how to go about it and, and what, what your thoughts and, and the way you do it. So I thought that was great. And uh, we'll look to have you again sometime soon, maybe after the draft. And appreciate you. Make sure you go check uh, all Nick's stuff out. So we'll catch you next time. Peace. Thank you.